My name is John Dupre, I'm a local mayor, and I want to welcome all of you to the city of New Baltimore. Uh, this is, uh, being a lakefront community, uh, this is a, a subject very important to all of us, and uh, it's, it really makes me feel good to see so many people show up. I'd like to thank uh, um, our, our librarian, uh, Margaret Thomas, for allowing us to have her building tonight. Um, and uh, I'd like to th uh, thank also uh, Bonnie McInerney Slater, who is a city employee, works with me. She uh, was the city personnel that put all this together. And especially, I want to thank a fellow named Brandon Lewis here, who is from the. He's the director of the Macomb County uh, Emergency Department, and um, he uh, helped us organize this and got all of the agencies. We have the uh, a federal agency, the the Army Corps of Engineers. We have a state agency, uh, Eagle. Uh, we have uh, the county here with us, uh, and so um, uh, we'll try to put on as much, get out as much information as you can. So uh, I, let's get right on to the meeting. Thank you all for coming. I'll turn it over to uh, Brandon Lewis, and uh, he can go from there. I promise we're going to knock over one of these bottles of water before the end of the night. It'll be the comic relief. Um, as the mayor said, I'm Brandon Lewis. I'm the director of the county's Office of Emergency Management Communications. Uh, welcome to uh, this town hall forum that uh, we're going to be putting on for you tonight on flooding concerns on Lake St. Clair. Um, we have several topics that we'd like to go through with all of you tonight, and then there will be plenty of time for question and answer at the end. Um, what we'd like to do is go through each of the presentations that we have. Um, some of our speakers have um, slideshow presentations and quite a bit to say. Some of our speakers have just a few things to say, but everybody's, everybody's here to answer questions. Um, I also have two members of my staff here that will be taking notes and taking down all of, the, all of the questions and the answers that we give to those questions for a couple of reasons. Uh, number one, as, as you're gonna find out in a minute, we have a wide breadth of um, experience and expertise here. Um, however, if for some reason we come across a question that none of our experts are able to answer for you, we are dedicated to getting that answer for all of you as quickly as possible, so we'll be making sure to take all of those questions down. And then we're hoping to create an FAQ sheet that we'll then put on our website at the county level and make available to the city to put to put it on their, on their website so that um, the important questions from tonight and the answers to those questions are captured and memorialized and you'll all be able to go back and reference them as the season goes on. So before we get into our first presentation, I'm gonna take the mic, I'm gonna pass it down the table here and have all of our panelists introduce themselves and then we'll uh, talk a little bit about how hydrology and lake levels. My name is Lauren Fry. I'm from the Army Corps of Engineers Detroit District Office of Great Lakes Hydraulics and Hydrology. So I'll be starting with the uh, hydrology and lake level talk. My name is Crystal Walker. I'm also with the Army Corps of Engineers Detroit District, but I'm in emergency management. So I'll be speaking on our emergency management authorities and what we're doing in your community. Hi, as the mayor stated, my name is Bonnie McInerney Slater. I've been working with the mayor to help coordinate response to some different flood issues within the city. Good evening. I'm Ken Goyke from Macomb County Public Works, Candace Miller's office. Good evening, Lieutenant Tim Catvertis, Michigan State Police Emergency Management, Homeland Security Division, and I'll be talking about what uh, resources the state police in the state of Michigan has provided uh, for the shoreline flooding as well as answering any questions for any type of declarations in the future. Um, we also have seated in the front row um, Bethany Paris and friends from uh, from Eagle from the Michigan Department of uh, the Environment Great Lakes and Energy. Did I get the E's in the right order? Okay, so just very briefly before we start the presentation, the topics we're going to cover tonight is we're going to go through first this presentation on hydrology and lake levels. Uh, then we will um, turn it over to the state for state perspective and updates on flooding issues. Then I'll talk just a little bit about the county perspective playing off of the state's perspective. Uh, then we'll talk a little bit about the local perspective and local resources. 
and the County Public Works Office will uh, discuss uh, their preparedness posture with you, and then we'll um, close with a discussion on uh, technical assistance and sandbagging with uh, Army Corps of Engineers, and then we will uh, we will take all of your questions. So with that, I am going to turn it over to Lauren to talk about the uh, hydrology. Okay, so thank you everybody for coming, um, and thanks for your patience standing in the back row. Uh, there is floor space if anybody wants to take a seat on the floor in front. Uh, I know this is a really popular subject for everybody. Why can't you have some of the people that are back there along the edge here? They kind of they want to. Sure. Yeah, if you want to come along the edge. Um, there's a little room on the edges, a little room up front on the floor. So hopefully you can make yourself comfortable. And um, I'm going to start by talking about Great Lakes hydrology and just kind of an overview of what's happening throughout the basin as well as what's happening here. Uh, so, I'm from the Office of Great Lakes Hydraulics and Hydrology, and we provide the forecasts that you guys see, like when you're when you're hearing about the Army Corps of Engineers official six-month forecast that's coming from our our office. We do that in partnership with our Canadian counterparts, so we're we're working on coordinating data and coordinating forecasts with them uh, in order to provide you guys with forecasts and also just monitoring the water levels and the water budget. Um, what? I'm going to go back to that picture there. <laughs> so the picture here, uh, for those of you who can see this, I know maybe in the back of the room it may be difficult. This is actually on Stony Point in Lake Erie. This is in the west end of Lake Erie. And this was on a windy day last May, I think. Um, so this is just one example. One of our more dramatic pictures that we have access to provided by the Port Director of Port Monroe. Um, so, so you know, we, we, we have wind conditions all the time, but now that we're at really high water levels, we're seeing significant impacts that you guys know full well. Okay, next slide. So before I go too far into detail, I just want to say a few things about water levels. If you can't read it, don't worry, I'll walk through what's going on this slide. Uh, but just so that we're all on the same page, when I'm talking about water levels, I'm talking about an uh, elevation, not a depth. So, so we think of, of water levels either in terms of depth over low water datum or more often in terms of elevation above sea level. We use elevation in terms of the International Great Lakes datum of 1985. That datum, just think of it as essentially elevation above sea level because that datum has its, has its reference point right at the outlet of the St. Lawrence River. Uh, when, I'm t when I'm talking, I will always refer to Lake Michigan and Lake Huron as one lake. I'll call it Lake Michigan Huron. Lake Michigan Huron, that's my habit as a hydrologist because they, those two lakes, they're hydraulically connected. They rise and fall as one lake. Uh, so when I'm talking about water levels, I'm talking about lake-wide average water levels. So this is a still water, water level. Uh, what you guys see at any given, given location on, along the lake at an, any given time of the day could be different from what we're reporting. We actually, we do report daily lake-wide average water levels, but our official statistics are based on monthly mean lake-wide average water levels. So if you think about variability on a given day and variability even across the lake, you know, if you get like a, a big windy day like today, you can have water stacking up on one side of the lake or the other. That kind of variability isn't reflected in the data that I talk about. That kind of variability is going to be something you can look at on the gauges on the lakes. Um, so speaking of gauges on the lakes, we're, we're computing our lake-wide average water levels using a network of gauges. Here on Lake St. Clair, we have two gauges, one in the U.S. and one in Canada. Those gauges are operated by NOAA on the U.S. side and by the Canadian Hydrographic Service on the Canadian side. And we pull data from all those ga gauges. We compute our lake-wide average water levels. We coordinate our monthly mean statistics with Canada. So everything is done uh, in a way that we have the same numbers that they're reporting. So on the U.S. side, the Detroit District Army Corps of Engineers were the official keeper of those monthly mean lake-wide average water levels. And we have data going back to 1918. So it's really a pretty long data set when you think of environmental data. Uh, I already talked about coordination with Environment and Climate Change Canada. The bolded, the bolded sentence on the, on the bottom says that the primary drivers of water levels are really the, fluctu of the, are really the fluctuations in water weather patterns 
um, that are driving precipitation, runoff, evaporation from the lake, and I'll talk about that in a bit. So here's a, a couple of graphics that I'm sure a lot of you have seen the one, some version of the one on the right. We all have bu bumper stickers that, that show something like that, right? Um, but what I, what I want to point out with that image on the right is that for the most part, every drop of water that lands on that green, green area, that's our Great Lakes Basin. So every drop of water, except for the little bit around Lake Ontario, every drop of water that lands on that green surface is going to be affecting your water levels. And the reason what happens on Lake Ontario isn't affecting you is because Niagara Falls, right? The Niagara River. So if water levels are high on Lake Ontario, that's not going to propagate up to us because of the drop of the Niagara Falls. And so that's shown here on the bottom, the bottom graphic where I go from, from west to east from Lake Superior, Lake Michigan, Huron. I think one thing that's, that's worth pointing out on this graphic for you guys on Lake St. Clair is that you can really see the connectivity between Lake Michigan, Huron, Lake St. Clair, and Lake Erie. Um, in fact, the, the water level of Lake St. Clair depends on the inflow from Lake Huron and the outflow to Lake Erie, right? So those flows are actually dependent on the difference in water level between the lakes. So, so if the lake level on Lake Erie is high, that's going to slow down flow for you in the Detroit River. So this, this, picture, um, this picture was taken on Grand Traverse Bay on the left side in the middle of the low water period on Lake Michigan Huron. Uh, this was in 2008, January. And then on the right side, this was taken by the same person in May of 2019, the same dock. And so this is kind of the difference that we're talking about in terms of looking at lake-wide average water levels. It's a little bit more now, but this is about five feet of difference between 2008 and 2019. This is a picture that uh, Crystal provided me from Lake St. Clair. So, so, you know, on that last picture from Lake Michigan Huron, when we look at still water, it's not that scary, right? But when you start to see wind and wave action on top of the high water levels, that's when you can see damages along coasts like this. So I'm going to go kind of work through the basin here, the Great Lakes Basin, go upstream, go ahead. So if you go upstream from Lake Michigan here on, we have Lake Superior. This is Duluth. This is actually from October of 2018. So water levels were already very high on Lake Superior. They had a big storm in October 2018, caused millions of dollars worth of damage. Um, it, we, we see a lot of these, these damaging storms happening in the fall and winter uh, on the lakes. And so this is the Duluth Harbor of massive wave coming in and they've had, they've had flooding damages there. Next slide. So this, this picture was taken from a news story by MLive. Um, this is on Lake, Lake Michigan. So we've pro probably many of you have seen this picture in the news. Uh, this, this kind of news really started kind of coming out in the past year where people are, are really experiencing erosion issues on, on the west side of the state. And here's that Stony Point picture I showed earlier. So again, both of these, you know, all these pictures are showing things that are natural. You know, we always have processes that are causing erosion. We always have waves, but we're at high water levels, so everything's a lot more impactful. And for this downstream, this is Lake Ontario. <laughs> Uh, this is this house made the news quite a bit in New York as they got dubbed the ice house. I think you can see why, and it's not a, not like a sculpture. This is a natural house that was close to the lake, and you know there's always freezing spray coming up. You know when there's waves, but if that water is right next to your house, that's when you see d potential damages. Uh, our lead forecaster actually knows the people who own that house, and I think they were able to melt themselves out with the help of neighbors, but uh, you know, think of think of potential damages there, so go ahead. Okay, so I, I know you guys can't see the numbers. I don't I don't want you to see the number, or well, I don't mind if you see the numbers. <laughs> that doesn't mean wrong, wrong. But no, this is online, you can look at the numbers there. The the point of this slide is really the wiggles, right? So every every time I talk about the lakes, I tend to go from upstream to downstream. So from, from the top, you have Lake Superior, Lake Michigan, Huron, Lake St. Clair, Lake Erie, and Lake Ontario. Okay, the first thing that you see is the wiggly blue line, right? So that wiggly blue line 
That's the, the historical data for the monthly mean lake-wide average water levels, going back all the way to 2018 on the left side of the graphic, and back to la last month on the right side of the graphic. The red lines going across the center, those are the long-term average annual water levels for each of the lakes. Um, the first thing that pops out, well, I guess the next thing that pop, pops out is that you have the, the, you have the wiggles, but you also have some interannual variabilities, you have variability. You have periods of highs, periods of lows throughout the, throughout the entire period of record. Um, so the, the next thing I want to point out is the period of low water, here we go, in red. So starting in about 1997-98, if you recall, Lake Michigan Huron and Lake, Saint Pierre, Lake Superior entered a very long period of low water, low water levels. Uh, and that included actually a record low water level on Lake Superior in 2007 and culminated in a record low water level on Lake Michigan Huron at the end of 2012 and the beginning of 2013. So people in our area, we remember that low water period pretty well. Subsequent to that, we had a record-setting two-year rise in 2013 and 2014. We had, very, we had a lot of water supply in, in 2013 and 14. Lake Superior and Lake Michigan had a record-setting two-year rise. Then, 15 and 16 wasn't too remarkable, but the past several years, 17, 18, and 19, have been very wet again. And so we've had, uh, more often than not, high water supply, and now each of the Great Lakes has set new record high water levels. All of the lakes except for Lake Michigan Huron set new record high water levels in 2019. Lake Michigan Huron set new record high water level last month. Okay, so remember when I showed the long-term graphic that had the, the blue line that was you know, pretty regularly going up and down. So each of the lakes has a pretty typical seasonal cycle. Here we have a generic <coughs> seasonal cycle for a Great Lake. The timing is a little bit different on each of the lakes, but it's pretty similar. So we have low water levels in the winter, January, February, December. Uh, water levels start going up in March, April, May, and we have highest water levels in the, in the summer, late summer, and then water levels go down. Go ahead. Okay, so the, the changes in water levels are actually driven by the processes in the hydrological cycle. So in the winter, we have snow accumulating on the Earth's surface, and it's not really running off, it's just accumulating. So it's kind of a quiet period, normally, where we don't have a lot of runoff. We've actually had a lot of runoff so far this winter. Um, then in the spring, we tend to have more precipitation that's actually falling as rainfall, so it's liquid precipitation running off quicker, and we have melting snow, so water levels go up, and that's primarily driven by liquid precipitation and increased runoff. Then in the summer, things kind of slow down. You don't see, you know, we start to see a drought if you're a gardener, you have drier conditions in July, August time frame, and, and you know, the river flows are less, so it's kind of a quiet time. What's important is that the sun is actually warming the surface of the lake, so that the sun is transferring energy to the lake's surface. And that's important because then, in the fall, the lake is really going to start evaporating. And so I think a, a lot of people think, well, if it's warm, we're going to have a lot of evaporation. Actually, what's, what's important is the difference between the air temperature and the lake surface temperature. Think about a cold glass of ice water on a hot summer day. You have condensation on that glass. So you, the reverse is true. If you have warm surface water, warm lake surface water, and then you have a blast of cold air like we start getting in the fall, we've had some cold air recently, um, and that's, that's really when evaporation is important. So you, you have a lot of water leaving the system in the fall in the form of evaporation. So we think of those three things together, the evaporation, the precipitation, and the runoff. We combine those together and call it net basin supply. So that's our net basin supply of water to each of the lakes. So the net basin supply, if, it's, if that plus the inflow from an upstream lake, so Lake Huron for you guys, minus the outflow to downstream lake, so Detroit River for you guys. If that's positive, like the lake level goes up, vice versa. It's just a water balance. Okay, so again, you can't see here, but this is primarily a reminder for me what to say. So 
so in terms of what's driving water levels, I could talk all day about all the components of the water cycle. But I think what's most, what's most remarkable over the past seven years, since 2013, is we've had very wet conditions in terms of precipitation. And so this is just one statistic that I'm gonna throw at you that comes from Climate at a Glance from NOAA, National Center for Environmental Information. They compile rankings so you can look up by river basins, so we can look up by the Great Lakes Basin. Uh, in terms of the ranking of precipitation over various time frames. So if we, look at, if we look at the Great Lakes Basin, at least on the U.S. side, then the past 12 months, the, the past two years, the past four years, and the past five years have been the wettest in our period of record. And this is out of about 125 years. So we've had a lot of precipitation recently. Uh, and, and, you know, I think if we went past, if we could build these statistics going back further, we know 2013 and 14, we also had a significant amount of precipitation. So just refresh our memory on what records we've been setting. So since May, we've started to see new records. Uh, and since May, we've seen new records on Lake Superior, St. Clair, and Erie. Uh, in June, Superior, St. Clair, and Erie, Erie, and Ontario actually hit their all-time record high in terms of compared to other months of the year. July, Superior, uh, St. Clair, Erie, and Ontario. Again, St. Clair was another new record compared to other months. August, Su Superior tied its previous record. Lake St. Clair and Erie both, both set new records. September, Superior tied its previous record. St. Clair and Erie set new records. Now in January, Superior, Michigan, Huron, and St. Clair. St. Clair actually tied its previous record high. Uh, so again, these records are based on data going back to 19 to 18, so it's about 100 years worth of data. Okay, so, so I said that our office uh, handles forecasting, and we do seasonal, seasonal projections of water levels going out six months. Does anybody in this room get our six-month forecast by mail? That's good to see. I, we actually send it out to about 4,000 people on the U.S. side of the border in the, in the Great Lakes. Uh, and you can sign up for it by mail or you can just go to our website. So when we're running our forecast at the beginning of each month, we'll be running it again next week, uh, we're, we're looking at a lot of things. We're looking at current basin conditions. We're looking at where, what the levels are right now. We're looking at climate outlooks for the future. So this is the latest climate outlook that comes from the Climate Prediction Center from NOAA. And on the top panel, this is showing the temperature and precipitation for March, so forecast for March. And I'll just explain what you're looking at. The temperature is on the left. So the colors there, the blue, that means a probability of being a, a below average temperature. It doesn't tell you how far below, but just the likelihood of being below normal temperature. Red means likelihood of being above normal temperature. The white area that says EC, if you can see that, the, the white area says equal chances of above or below average temperature. It doesn't mean it's going to be average. It just means we don't know if it's going to be above or below average. So we don't know for March. Yeah. So, so on the right side, so on the right side, that's precipitation. Again, brown means likelihood of below average precipitation. Green means likelihood of above average precipitation. Uh, so, you know, we got excited because we're seeing this big brown spot over the Great Lakes. So that means we're likelihood of below average precipitation. On the bottom graphic, this is actually showing the three month kind of cumulative forecast for March, April, May. So for March, April, May, they are predicting a likelihood for above average temperatures and also a likelihood for above average precipitation. So that's kind of the full spring outlook. I'll also mention that a lot of times what we're looking at on, this, on these graphics for precipitation is a big white area. Pretty often, because precipitation is difficult to predict, we actually do see equal chances of precipitation. Lately, uh, we've been seeing a lot of you know, consistent forecasts for wet wetness in the future. So that's a signal that we don't always see. Okay, so if you receive our, our monthly bulletin, I'm showing here just another way to look at our forecast, which is available on our webpage. Um, so I'm going to walk through 
all of the lakes here, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna start with Lake Superior and go through kind of what each of the data uh, pieces are on this graphic, because there's a lot of information. So from left to right, we just have calendar months from January to December. The blue squiggly line, that's showing the, the daily lakewide average water levels from 2019. And the red squiggly line, which is just a little bit above the blue line, that's showing the daily lakewide average water levels for 2020. There's green dots that go out from February, March, April, May, June, and July. Those are our, our latest six month forecast, which was produced at the beginning of February. So the green dots are what we think is the best estimate of our forecast. What you can probably see a little better is the red vertical lines. That's our uncertainty in our forecast. You know, because if things are wetter, things are gonna go higher and vice versa. So for Lake Superior, uh, we're predicting just a little bit above a uh, record high and then kind of moving toward levels that we saw last year. Now for Lake Michigan Huron, which is on the bottom, our forecast actually pre predicted that the lake would be about four to seven inches above record high water levels for each of the next six months of the, of the period. Um, so that, that's a pretty significant, uh, pretty significant forecast. And if you look at the first couple months, and even the third month, for at least the first couple months, our whole forecast uncertainty range is above record high. So that's, that's we're pretty sure. You know, we get a little less sure as we go out, but the odds are pretty good for new record highs throughout the forecast horizon. Uh, let's go back. The other thing to point out that's really visible on Lake Michigan here, but it's true for all the lakes, is that the 2020 levels are quite a bit higher than the 2019 levels. So where we started, it, when we were running the forecast, the January numbers were higher than the January 2019 levels. And so when you're seeing forecasts that are, that are starting out above last year's levels, that's a, that's a major driver, it's just where you're starting. Because remember I talked about the seasonal cycle. That seasonal cycle is happening on top of already high water levels. So it, it would take pretty dry conditions to bring us back down. Okay, so here's Lake St. Clair. Um, so for Lake St. Clair, we are predicting new records early in the forecast. Later in the forecast, we'll be closer to last year's le levels. Uh, I think you, it's interesting, you can see here the, the February, the little drop in February. That's actually probably an ice jam. You know, when you have ice jam up, up river and you see your le levels drop on the lake, then you see flooding upstream, right? So Lake Erie and Lake Ontario, well, Lake Erie is pretty similar kind of story to Lake St. Clair. Lake Ontario, uh, the forecast isn't showing new record highs for any of the months, except in our uncertainty band. And I'll note that the uncertainty band is pretty wide for Lake Ontario, and part of that is because of the need to be able to represent downstream processes, because that influences the regulation. Okay. So I've gone through a lot of information, and I know like anybody from the fourth row back probably couldn't see any of what I was showing. Uh, we do have a website that, that I think Crystal will point, up, point out to at our district homepage that, that stood up for this specific high water period. If you just Google Army Corps of Engineers Detroit District or even just Army Corps of Engineers High Water, Great Lakes High Water, you'll get to this landing page and if you click on a water levels button you'll get to all of the information I talked about and more. Um, and my phone number is here, my, my email address, I can talk to you after if you'd like. And then I also put, put my boss's email and phone number. We actually do answer our phone. I think I spent four hours on the phone the other day. Um, so we're talking to the public, we're talking, you know, if you call my desk, I will answer and I'll spend time talking to you, talk you through the graphics that we have, because a lot of them have a lot of information that you may not, may not be aware of. So feel free to call. All right, thanks, Lauren. Uh, next up, we're going to get a few remarks on the state's perspective. Uh, Lieutenant Tim Capertis from the Michigan State Police Emergency Management Division. Thanks, sir. Again, good evening, everyone. I'm Lieutenant Tim Capertis from the State Police Emergency Management Homeland Security Division. Uh, we are the coordinating agency at the state level 
uh, for any type of state of disasters or emergencies and we work closely with our local emergency management programs. Uh, we're bound by Public Act 390, which is the Emergency Management Act, and that creates a framework for what duties or obligations that the governor has, all the way down to our local uh, chief elected officials. Uh, the act is pretty much based on uh, damage. So we work closely with our local emergency managers in collecting the amount of damage within a local jurisdiction or community and then we also monitor what resources they may need or request. So again, these declarations start locally and if the local jurisdiction uh, runs out of a certain resource or needs assistance, their next step is to the local county level and if the county can provide that resource, great. If the county cannot, then they turn to the state and hopefully the state can provide that resource. If the state does not have that resource, then we can reach out uh, to the federal government through FEMA and federal assistance uh, typically will be granted to provide that resource. So under Public Act 390, that framework, uh, we work again closely with our federal partners such as the Army Corps of Engineers, which we have been, all the way down to our local officials. Uh, for the shoreline erosion, we started uh, last March, March of 2019, working with our local emergency managers, uh, Macomb County, St. Clair County. We were pretty much the first in the state impacted by the high lake levels. Uh, in the springtime, we get our winds typically out of the east, push water up on the shore. So I worked with uh, Brandon uh, and his staff documenting the shoreline erosion, documenting any uh, endangered structures or any issues with any public utilities that may impact all of us, our citizens. So at this point in time, the state police, we've been monitoring, we've been providing uh, support such as uh, aviation assets to start mapping our lakeshore all over the state. Uh, GIS or mapping data, providing that down to the local level so we have some comparison to the last time we uh, dealt with uh, a flood or shoreline flooding with that. And then we're monitoring any resource requests that may, may be needed. So we do this for the entire state of Michigan. So uh, we had some photos up here in our presentation from the core of issues with uh, endangered structures over on Lake Michigan this fall. We're helping those communities and counties as well. So we're here to assist. We also share all this information with our other state agencies to provide support. And then, of course, everything goes up to our governor's office. Uh, for her awareness and we're just monitoring collecting data we also share this data with our federal partners at FEMA so they're very involved uh, if we do have to ask for federal resources they know exactly daily what's going on in, in uh, the state uh, as well as the Great Lakes Basin good, good enough okay. Thanks, so I'll go next and I'm just going to very briefly discuss the, the county's role in this process because we kind of stand in the middle of the state and a lot of the resources that they have and the local jurisdictions, the local levels of government, which is where um, all emergencies and disasters start. Um, we like to say in emergency management, um, disasters and emergencies are local and they're, they're handled at the locus, lo lowest level of government that's capable of responding to the incident so um, prime you know primary contact for issues within the city would be the city of New Baltimore until their resources are exhausted and then they would work with us and you know we would we would do what we can until the county's resources are exhausted then we reach out to the state and then in in a major incident there's the potential for a you know, a federal presidential declaration that can be made by the President of the United States, and you've probably heard about those on television in the, in the aftermath of a major event. So one of the things that it's important to note is at no level of state government is there any type of contingency fund that covers, that covers individual damages resulting from a disaster. Um, and only at the state level is there a contingency fund that covers public damages related to a disaster. Um, 
so typically when in the disaster declaration process if you're talking about if we're talking about funding we're talking about getting funding back from the federal government and as as terrible as these incidents are for all of us this is not likely to catch the radar of the federal government so we collectively are you know kind of working together to you know get public information out there um, help residents take preparedness steps now before the water levels start to really rise up during that um, during that water level cycle that Lauren talked about um, we have you know we have several places that uh, we encourage people to look there's um, FEMA has a FEMA has a flooding website where they discuss the particulars of flooding and they discuss flood insurance and we had a few of those flyers here with us tonight but I think with the size of the crowd we we ran out um, but we will be posting those both on the county website and on the city website so that anybody can access those um, we put information out quite a bit for those of you who are on social media our department operates a Facebook page so we put information out all the time on our Facebook page including um, we you know, we try very hard to make sure that we put all the lakeshore flood warnings on there so that um, our residents are notified in advance. And then um, we we are going to be setting up, um, in conjunction with these town hall meetings, we're going to be setting up um, a dedicated website on our county's, on my department's page that uh, will allow residents of the county to log on, to get onto our web page and download, you know, FAQs from these sessions and, and pertinent flooding resources and we'll make sure that those are updated as we go along with the with the input from uh, all of these uh, all these experts that are here tonight and many more and any good information that uh, that we find that we can make available to you so with that um, do you guys have any comments from the city's level at this time sure I right, folks just briefly um, uh, thank you again for the, uh, all the state agencies, the county agencies that come. Uh, uh, the city of Baltimore is uh, we're responsible for the, your interface on a day-to-day -day basis. The uh, our city employees are the people you're going to see when you need help. Uh, what we've been doing uh, so far, I think we've purchased uh, and, and uh, gave out, given out uh, 15,000 sandbags as of the end of the year, we just purchased another 10,000 sandbags. Uh, the city council agreed to purchase a sandbagging machine. If you didn't see that in the paper, it's uh, it, it has an auger in it a, and a, ho a hopper. If you fill it up, uh, we can sandbag approximately 1,000 sandbags an hour. And uh, we are we yeah, w as long as we have volunteers. Uh, so we're, we're working with uh, the, the schools and other uh, nonprofits to get some volunteers. We can punt out a lot of sandbags in a short amount of time. Um, city Council also agreed to uh, uh, keep, uh, procure or allow money out of the general fund for any emergencies that we have. Uh, on a daily basis, from the city's standpoint, what uh, we're worried about is your assets your underground assets, the water pipes, the stuff you don't see, the sewer pipes, the stormwater drains. And when those come up out of ground, there are um, pumping stations at the end, all throughout the city. And so we're worried about those and that's our job to make sure that those stay uh, healthy and safe. Uh, what you're concerned about here is your own private property. Um, there are certain things that the city can do to help you. Uh, we can basically we can help you to help yourself with the tools to do it uh, the, and i think the the uh, folks here will um, uh, back, uh, back me up or say uh, the, a government agency is not allowed to repair your private property but we can give you the tools to protect your property and that's what we will do and that's what we're going to do if you have problems uh call city hall and uh, we'll do our best to try to help you with that so i'll um yeah. Once again, I'm Ken Goyke from Macomb County Public Works, Candace Miller's office. And um, we're in charge of the county drains. So we work underneath Public Act 40 of 1956. And all the, the county drains were petitioned. And then them are the only drains that we're allowed to work on as long as we have easements on. In New Baltimore, we have the Crapple Creek and the uh, Vanderveen. Them are our two drains. 
So our main perspective is to make sure that the water traverses through there. So it, uh, you know, we're upstream basically for most of you people in town here so that the, the water is going down in your yards. But we have to remember that we're looking at an elevation of 577.40 that it peaked at last year. And if they're talking about it going up another six inches, so it's only almost going to be uh, 577 and an elevation. And that's where we're going to have big problems close to the road lines, you know, and it's going to bring the water up in, in all of our drains as well. But our focus is to keep them drains open for everyone so that the water can and it, you know, gets down into the, you know, our bigger reservoirs, which is Lake St. Clair, for it to drain well. Um, also, be very mindful, and just like the mayor was talking about, of when you do have erosion factors that are happening because of the velocity of the water working so hard, that it's going to expose, you know, some of your utilities. In our easements, we do have some utilities of the gas and electric and stuff like that. Please be very, very cautious and don't experiment on your own to find out what it is. Call a professional in so that you don't get electrocuted or anything like that happens. I know it's pretty common sense, but I just want to make that point so everybody realizes that. Um, and the other thing that our department is uh, in charge of is uh, our soil erosion permits throughout the county, except for St. Clair Shores and in Sterling Heights, they do their own. Anytime that you're going to bring any dirt in, you do need a soil erosion permit. But uh, just dumping dirt is what we want to make sure that you don't do up against the lake shores and stuff because just dumping dirt, it's going to erode right back into it. So you, you know, follow the sandbagging policy with the plastic so that you do it in that way. And there's no, no permits or anything required from that or our department. If you have any questions, you can call our department and we, you know, we can hopefully answer any of your questions. But a lot of the other the road ditches and stuff are the Department of Roads and just those two creeks are what we're in charge of here and um, if there is high water be very cautious because you know even on the roadways it could be undermined and it could you know actually collapse uh, because water is the most powerful thing that you want to don't want to mess with so in closing uh, thank you very much i'm just going to grab this two quick things that i'd like to mention also um, one of them is uh, if you should experience flooding in your uh, at your property, uh, you are not allowed, I am not allowed, to drain that water, that storm water, into sewers. You, uh, the sanitary sewers cannot take uh, uh, storm water. If you have a piece of property and you see that uh, your flooding is in danger of going into a sanitary sewer on your property, let us know. Um, you are not allowed to drain um, uh, any, any excess water and pump it over and put it down a sanitary sewer. Uh, please do not do that. Uh, we can all get in a lot of trouble. Um, the, the other thing is that if you have, uh, starting right now, if you have or have had property damage on your property, uh, we'd like to know about it. What was it? How much was it? Uh, how much did it cost, or how, what do you estimate that damage to be? We would like to, uh, we're gonna, we want to keep track of all that information and so that we can pass it on through the county emergency department and uh, eventually get to the state. Uh, if it gets up enough and this goes all through the state, uh, this will be a, a, a tool that we can use to petition the governor and FEMA for, for help for our community. So. Um, uh, document whatever you can, okay? And uh, when you get that documentation, get it to City Hall so that we can record it. Okay, thank you. And uh, last, we're going to turn it over to Krista Walker from the Army Corps of Engineers, and she is going to talk about um, sandbagging, technical assistance, and other flood prevention measures. All right, good evening. So my name is Crystal Walker. I'm with uh, the Army Corps of Engineers Emergency Management, as I mentioned. Um, so I'm gonna touch on pretty much, um, I'm gonna wrap up basically what our other great emergency management personnel have touched on and then go into a lot more detail on some topics. Um, so you can go to the first slide. Um, 
So essentially uh, what the next slide is going to read is, um, so what does all this mean? What, is, what does all this mean for you guys? So we talked about water levels. We talked about what the state can do, the city, the county. Um, the Army Corps of Engineers is often brought up um, as uh, what can they do? Where do they fit into this? So that's what I'm going to kind of touch on today. And I'm going to talk about all of our capabilities in terms of a timeline. What we can do right now, immediate assistance under emergency response all the way up to what we can do over the long term within our catalog of programs. So the Army Corps of Engineers, um, a lot of our missions are very visible, our navigation channels, our hydropower dams, those kind of things. But we also do have an emergency management mission. And I say that as an emergency management mission, we're not an emergency management agency. So we're not FEMA. Um, this is a small part of our job and our authorities are defined by um, our granted authorities and that's what we can do. Um, so you can go ahead and just get that one more. Okay, so first off, I gotta start with the legal jargon. My apologies, I know it's late. Um, so all of our emergency response uh, support falls under two main buckets, um, two authorities. So the first is what's called Public Law 8499. It is truly a law, you can Google it. It's great reading, let me tell you. Um, but it basically is our authority within the Army Corps of Engineers to provide emergency management support to other government entities. So if they're experiencing a disaster, their resources are expended, they can come to us and make use of our resources for their challenges. The second is what's known as the Stafford Act. So when you see that Army Corps of Engineer person out there, red shirt, castle on the back, um, putting up a blue roof, or clearing debris after a big hurricane, all of that is in partnership with FEMA, and it's for those large presidential disasters. So the reason that I'm starting with all this legal jargon is not so that you guys know that detail, but just to specify that right now, this is not a presidentially declared disaster, so everything that we're doing in your community is under Public Law 8499 and all of the uh, boundaries that come with that authority. So we're not here with partner in partnership with FEMA. It's not FEMA money. Right now, FEMA is a separate entity to us. Next slide, please. Um, so again, Public Law 8499. So again, what that means, um, I actually love going after all the other emergency managers that kind of explained it already. Um, so we're supplemental. We're that highest tier of everybody else has gone through everything they have and then we can get involved. And because of that, um, what's very important for communities to understand is that we cannot get involved in a disaster until it is requested by the state. And as part of that request, the state actually has to say, we're tapped out. We don't have it. You guys have something we don't. Um, and please bring it into this community for this issue. So um, that's a very big deal for us. And because of that, we're big on communication. So uh, Kev Burtis over there, he's my buddy. Brandon, we've been talking for a year. So we're really into that communication. Um, when your city says document, we're going to say the same thing. We're going to make sure that that entire chain of communication is engaged so that we're keeping that hierarchy of support. Next slide, please. Ha -ha. So they say never start with a negative, but this is a very important legal point within our public law, so I'm going to lead with it. My apologies. Um, under public law 8499, we have no authority to address erosion. It is very clearly stated, and it is a hard limit. So anything having to do with erosion is a non-starter for any of our other capabilities. But what we can do, so um, under emergency response, everything falls into two main buckets. I know I said that already, but. Um, so the first is technical assistance, which is kind of a vague capability, which is great for communities. Essentially what it boils down to is a community can come to us with some kind of challenge and we can throw all of the data, mind power, modeling, any kind of knowledge that we have in our agency at that challenge to see how we can solve it. So um, for example, we have a huge repository of data. We have uh, models that we've built. We have um, data sets over 100 years of lake levels. We have people. Um, all of those can be provided to a community 
based on their need. So it's actually really great um, because it's vague, we get to provide solutions and work through those things. Um, what's also great about it is that it's completely free to every other level of government. The city, the county, or the state, nobody pays for it. It's all internal Army Corps of Engineers funding. Next slide, please. And so one of the, um, the facets of technical assistance that we really want you guys to know about is that every district has a trained flood fight team. So on an annual basis, they go out and get trained on flood fight techniques. And in addition to that, how to train flood fight techniques. So really the point of them is that they can be deployed into your community in emergency times, the water is rising, um, we need help right now, or in advance of something to teach you guys what you need to do. So um, there is a proper way to sandbag. Uh, some of you may know that, we're gonna touch on it here in a minute. Um, but they're a great asset in times of uh, flooding and they're one of the capabilities covered by technical assistance. So currently, um, as you guys know, this event has been going on for going on a year at this point. Um, our Emergency Operations Center activated in May of last year and we are currently providing support to 12 counties in Michigan for technical assistance. So Macomb is one of those. And as the guys already mentioned, um, you guys were one of the first to get approved for that technical assistance. So we've been in several communities, including New Baltimore, for many, many months now. We're intimate with your uh, issues, and we've really gotten that relationship with your city, county, and state down pat. In addition to uh, those 12 counties, we're also supporting six in Wisconsin. And overall, so 18 counties, typically what we're doing for technical assistance, what does that actually mean? What are we doing on the ground? More often than not, we're doing sandbagging trainings. We're on um, different properties, making uh, recommendations on where to place sandbags, how to place sandbags, how to set up community efforts. Um, you actually need a lot more sandbags than you think you do. Those kind of things. So our uh, flood fight team have been in your community in 2019. So, talking about sandbagging, did you know that there is an ideal way to fill them? Ideally, you want every sandbag to be filled between one half and two thirds full. And there's reasons for that. So the first is it saves your back, it's a little bit lighter. And secondly, and more important, if it's too full, it doesn't provide the seal that you're looking for. You want that pliability in the structure if you do it too little, then you're just wasting resources. So you'll need more sandbags and you're gonna just waste effort filling extra. Next, please. Did you know that you don't have to tie them? If you are filling and placing next to your filling location, you can actually fill them by just tucking under the edge. Again, it's a time saver. Um, it's also a material saver. You don't have to have all that twine. Um, but if you're moving them from, say, a staging area to your property, you would need to tie them. So there is kind of that, that analysis that goes into it about what do I need to be doing here. Um, if you do do the tuck method, you need to make sure that it's placed uh, opposite the flow of water so that it doesn't take it and actually pull it away from you. Next, please. Did you know that a pyramid is actually the most stable structure you can build with your sandbags? So the reason that you want to do that, especially along the lakeshore when you have a wave environment, is that this is going to hold up the best over time and also to waves. So for every level you raise up, you need to add at least one level coming out. So one of the planning considerations for homeowners is a properly built pyramid-shaped sandbag structure can take a lot of room on your property. So if you're looking at a two foot high, you're probably looking at about six feet wide. So again, that number of sandbags adds up. You can do other structures besides pyramids, um, but again, they're not gonna be nearly as sturdy, and so you're probably gonna have to maintain that structure through time. And then kind of the last principle that I wanted to point out is someone mentioned uh, plastic earlier. We highly recommend using plastic if you're putting out sandbag structures. Um, it's really, really good for the structure to keep the sun off of it. Um, sandbags do have a, um, a, a life... Uh, uh, UV life. Yeah, a, U, thank you. a UV life out in the field. So 
an entire year out in the sun, freeze thaw cycles, um, summer heat, all of that is just going to wreak havoc on them. Plastic really helps to prolong the life of that. Um, but again, there is a proper way to place it. If you wrap the entire structure in plastic, it can actually get wet and roll away from you. <laughs> so uh, there is, you want to make sure that it's on the water side only and then properly tucked and uh, uh, protected. So, um, and these plus more is what we basically bring into communities when we're giving sandbagging trainings. We talk about um, uh, considerations in floodwaters. Are you in a sanitary environment? What are the what is the wildlife doing when it's flooding? Um, are you pro following proper safety procedures? All of that is covered in a sandbag training. And again, this is the bulk of what we've been doing. So some examples of what we did in 2019. Um, so all of these are actually uh, southeast Michigan coast. So in the top left, you can see that we definitely had communities that have seen feet rise in water. That's a lot to sandbag, especially when it's coming up very quickly. So, um, uh, so the top left and the top right, both of those were in the city of Detroit. So we actually oversaw their sandbag effort. So we taught the entire crew how to fill those sandbags, place those sandbags. Uh, you can actually see uh, my colleague there um, moving those sandbags. So we will be in the community doing that effort with you. On the bottom left, um, if you can see, uh, this was Lake St. Clair. Um, so we've seen infrastructure that's under feet of water. So this was actually fire hydrants in a manhole, if you can see it, um, under two feet of water last June. So that's a huge fire safety and life safety risk for the vicinity of that. That is a huge challenge for, challenge for communities. We're able to come out and throw everything we got at it trying to solve that problem. And then on, uh, on the bottom, you know, your city talked about water going into your sanitary sewers. That's been a huge problem for a lot of communities in this county. Um, and similar to your sewers, your roads. If your roads are impassable, again, that's a life safety issue. How do you get ambulance in, fire, those kind of support uh, vehicles. So um, community solutions. If you sandbag but your neighbor doesn't, is it really worth your effort? So again, all those recommendations is what we're doing in your community. So that was all technical assistance. So that's the first type of assistance we can provide. The second is called direct assistance. So that's our ability to provide actual flood fight supplies to communities. So we can provide sandbags, um, uh, plastic sheeting, and large uh, metal frame wrapped sandbags called HESCO barriers. Um, but this one comes with a little more uh, uh, guidelines um, in our authority. So these are to be used only for critical public infrastructure, and they have to be paid back to us. So our unit cost is a little bit lower than, say, if you went down to the local hardware store. Um, but it's the big point here is that this is to, supposed to be done only if resources in a community are already exhausted. So it's not for private homeowners, and it does have to be paid back to us. Next slide, please. So I just want to come back to this, because not so much in your community, but it has been a major discussion point for us. But the, the inability to respond to erosion under emergency response doesn't mean that we don't have a part in the conversation as the core. Next slide, please. You can hit two. So um, if you're not aware, we are a regulatory agency as well. Um, we have a permitting authority in and along the lakeshore. So if you are placing structures, not only do you need a permit with us, uh, we do everything in partnership with Eagle, so you'll need a permit with them. And then you also may need city and county permits in, in addition to that. So we just kind of wanted to bring to your attention that uh, these types of things, even sandbags, I don't want to advise on city and county um, procedure, but even those could require permits. So just make sure that if you're placing structures that you're following that proper process. Next slide, please. And so uh, another thing that I wanted to touch on is, um, of course, in the core, we do a lot of uh, longer term work. We're always out constructing something. And so we do have an entire catalog of programs that can address flooding and erosion issues in a community. So um, what you're seeing here is this is a, a snapshot of our continuing authority programs. So um, the goal here isn't that you walk away knowing exactly what the cost share is or um, the amount we can spend. But what I'm trying to bring to your attention here is um, 
while we do have these programs, um, they are often cost shared. So for example, uh, let's see, uh, Section 205 flood damage reduction is cost shared at 65 federal, 35 uh, sponsor. So your city or county would have to provide that 35% match. Um, and uh, oftentimes the lead times on these are very long. So typically one of these projects, you're looking at two to 10 years once approved and funded to get that project constructed. So we're in that whole thing about uh, communication. We're addressing this from the immediate, from your emergency response, you have water right now. But we're also working with your communities in terms of what do we need to be looking at in the long term? How, what is 2021 going to look like? What is 2025 going to look like? Those kind of things. Next slide, please. So a, a similar example, uh, we can do studies. Um, this particular program allows us to do a study on the floodplain and what's going on in it. So several communities are pursuing something like this just to figure out what their best long-term solution is. Um, this is 100% federally funded, but I want to draw your attention to the timeline point at the very bottom. Uh, this would take one to two years to complete once approved and funded. So again, your lead time on these. And then I kind of touched on this, but again, going back to that continuing authority program, Section 205, um, it's, it's a rather large cost share. Um, and then the timeline is two to 10 years if approved and funded. So kind of the key takeaways, um, I'm gonna steal some of Warren's thunder too, uh, but from the core, um, First, 2020 is going to see a continued pattern of rec record or near record lake levels. So our forecasts aren't looking um, super optimistic. Um, our next one in March is going to be coming out next week. So we'll, uh, we'll get a new picture on what the summer is going to look like. But at this point, we're really hunkering down for another challenging year. And so because of that, so me and emergency management, um, we're partnered with all of your other emergency management systems. So again, we're talking to the county, we're talking to the state, we have those relationships in place so that we're aware of the documentation, what's going on in your communities, and they're bringing us their challenges that we can try to throw our resources at, it, at, at as well. Um, I, I touched on erosion protection uh, permitting, so just make sure that you're including us kind of on the checklist of did I talk to all these agencies. And then finally, we do have longer term options within this agency, um, and we're definitely talking about those with your communities. We just want to be very transparent with you guys that those take time. Um, to get something constructed in your community is typically a one to ten year process. So. Um, um, so one resource that we highly recommend for you guys, uh, for it's written for the public, it was actually written back in the late 90s, I believe, in conjunction with Sea Grant, is this Living on the Coast uh, document. It goes through a whole suite of options and educational topics that you guys are going to be experiencing with high lake levels. So it touches on proper sandbagging, it, it touches on bluff erosion, how to talk to contractors. It's just got a lot of really good stuff in it. So uh, my biggest recommendation though, um, it was written in the 90s, so please don't use that contact information. <laughs> um, if you go to the next slide, please. Um, I'm gonna bring you back to our website that Lauren talked about. Um, we have that publication linked on this website, so please just make sure you're following these uh, contact information. Um, uh, notes instead of the ones in that document and then this one's going to be a little different so we have I again list uh, Lauren's boss in terms of if you have questions about lake levels you can reach out to him and then if you have any questions about emergency management or technical assistance what that looks like in your community those kind of things um, first we're going to uh, recommend that you as we mentioned talk to your city talk to your county talk to your state um, because we really need to make sure that they're aware of what's going on first and then um, we will answer emails um, as well so our email address is listed down below and I have cards so um, we, we understand this is incredibly challenging right now um, this website we're attempting to make one door to the core it's a landing page if you have questions or anything like that it'll give you points of contact from all the major offices um, including our outreach which goes through a lot of those longer-term programs so um, 
yeah, we're we're trying we're trying to make this process as painless as uh, possible. So, and with that, we open it for questions. Okay, I'll just say a couple of last things, and I'll let the mayor have the last say, and then we'll. Uh, <clears throat> So just to add on to uh, Crystal's presentation, uh, the county has had a technical uh, assistance agreement with the Army Corps of Engineers since May of last year. Yes, yeah. And under that, we what it's mostly been used for is to have uh, staff from the Army Corps of Engineers Emergency Management Office come out and work with property owners on uh, proper placement of sandbags, proper sandbagging techniques, and and other flood prevention measures that they might be able to take on their on their property. Um, that technical assistance agreement is still in effect between the county and the Army Corps of Engineers for this year, and we very much hope that uh, residents will will take advantage of it because it's it's a great service and they're absolutely fantastic about getting out within a few days to uh, talk with homeowners and and give them advice. So what we would ask if you're interested in that is to um, reach out to City Hall. Um, all of the requests have to go through the county's emergency management office. So what we've asked all of our locals to do is to um, is to work with their local populations to determine interest in doing that. And then we'll work with the Army Corps of Engineers to set up specific days where they can be out on site in each of our communities and um, then set up appointments and they can go to all of the properties that have set up appointments and and provide that critical advice so it's a really great service uh, that they provide to us at the county and to the locals and please don't hesitate to uh, to take advantage of that um, if unless any of our panelists have anything else to add I'm gonna let the mayor have the final comment and then we will take questions Folks, if you're at our city park, or in fact, if you look up right out the parking lot here, you, the, the property, the, the land that you see, whether it's islands or, or mainland, uh, that you're looking at is the Clay Township. Um, and uh, tonight, uh, here visiting us is Artie Bryson, who is the superintendent, superintendent, supervisor, supervisor of that township, Clay Township. And uh, he is an expert because uh, the... Uh, uh, Harsons Island is in his territory, so he knows all about this. So he just wanted to say a word. Yeah, thank you. I just wanted to bring up a few points that wasn't covered tonight, and uh, you know, we got a good chance of being screwed this year. <laughs> That's why we're here. That's why you guys are here. Everyone's worried, and there's a lot of information out there. I want to add to a little bit. Um, I, I was just writing down uh, notes. Uh, FEMA. If you're uh, thinking about contemplating get FEMA insurance, and believe me, I'm the big, biggest critic of FEMA there is. I hate writing that check more than any other check I write. But um, if you don't have flood insurance, you may want to consider it. It takes, I can't remember if it's a two or three month waiting period. It's 30 days. Uh, is it 30 days? Anyhow, there's a waiting period before it kicks in. So if you're thinking a couple, three months, you're gonna have problems, you may want to get it now or in the next month. And if you do, do get it, for instance, I just bought a house on, island, on the island, it was a tear down house. Um, I had to get FEMA insurance. They first quoted me $1,600 for the insurance. That's a tear-down house. But I, I had to get it because the mortgage company. I went and got my ele uh, elevation certificate. It cost me about 300 bucks. That reduced it, in my case, down to $800. So if you're thinking about getting uh, flood insurance, get a, a, a flood elevation certificate. It's well worth your money. Um, another thing, if you have FEMA, it's uh, not a well-known fact. They will pay you $1,000 for flood mitigation. In other words, uh, they'll, they'll pay for sandbags, they'll pay for sand, they'll pay for labor. Uh, doing, to help you, it's a one-time deal, $1,000 for flood mitigation. And what I would do is, I, it's a reimbursement. Um, I would contact your insurance agent first and find out exactly what documentation you need that to. But um, 
like I say, they'll, they'll pay for the labor or your supplies, whatever you use for flood mitigation. Um, the, um, what else was I going to say? These water, I, I mean, I, I lived on this on the water my whole life. I, my family's made their living on the water for four generations. I, I lived and breathed the water levels even when it was low or medium. You know, I, I just watch it very closely. What really scares me about our forecast, like last year, we had a lot of snow melt up in the UP, and the what affects our levels too, if the ice, the Great Lakes are covered with ice, which had been the last two years, there's no evaporation. Thank God we didn't have that this year. Um, although when there's no ice on the, on the lakes, it's a bigger problem for erosion because the winds blow, creates waves. The ice kind of protects the shoreline too against waves. But last year, because of that, we had a big spike in our water levels end of May, beginning of June. We're not, we're, we'll see a little spike, but not as big. What really scares the bejesus out of me is the levels in Lake Huron. They, they're forecasted to be four to seven inches higher than they were last year. That water has to come down here. Am I right? Eventually? I mean, that, that's really what scares me a lot. Um, I know they're saying that uh, we're going to probably be above average through June and peak at about average right now. But we have a big cone of uncertainty, uncertainty also. And the problem is, too, the water or our ground is so saturated, any kind of weather anomaly affects the, the water levels big time. Uh, there, the, we don't get any absorption from uh, rainfall now. It goes right in and affects us quick and direct. Um, so you really need to be prepared and have a plan. Um, a little bit about sandbagging. If you go two bags high, I found out it was about 600 bags for 100 feet. For two feet? For, for two bags. Oh, yes. So for a two bag height, it's 600 bags for 100 feet. <clears throat> If you're filling them up correctly, three quarters full, one yard of sand will give you 55 bags. So if you know, figure out what you need to do and get, um, those are pretty, pretty uh, uh, good numbers there. I know I, Clay Township, we did 600 bags, 600,000 bags last year in our township. I'm sorry, one yard of sand would be how many? 55 bags, okay? <laughs> Um, and another uh, option are these water diversion tubes, where they, they're basic tubes that you fill up with water. Um, we, we, we help sell, we, 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 I don't know, I, I, we bought some and sold them at the township, about 450 of them. They're, if you have a 12 inch tube, it will stop about seven inches of water. Um, if you need to stop more water, you gotta get a, a bigger tube. But what you have to do is put sandbags or something behind it to stop it to roll, because they'll roll like a hot dog. <laughs> um, that's what they are, a big hot dog. Uh, a lot of times that's a pretty good alternative. Uh, you know, when the, when the water goes down, you just drain the things, roll them up, and take them away. I think you, you just remind me, Melody. One more thing about FEMA. Um, they, they're, they're changing their rates. They were going to do it 2020 this year, but it's election year. So they put it off to 2021. 2021, our FEMA rates are going to go up about 20 to 25%. But if you get it now, they'll grandfather your rates and you will not see a rate increase if you have it. And if you're even thinking about selling your house, you might want to get it because um, if you don't let an interruption in the, in the, in the policy and the, the rate will be transferred if you sell your house to the new buyer, chances are they'll have a mortgage and they'll need it. So you can, it, it stays with the property. You can transfer it to the new buyer if, if it's sold. So that's another thing. Where do you get that certificate? 
mentioned. Any civil engineer. Go ahead. Any civil engineer. Uh, you know, there's, uh, I know Matt Mueller in our township and uh, Project Control Engineering, they, they do them. Um, uh, they, they're about 300, 350 bucks. What do those tubes cost? Uh, we were selling a 100 footer is about, for the 12 inch ones, about 400 bucks now. You can get them online. The company we were using was AIRE, A I R E Industries. And that was the cheapest one I found. And I negotiated a, a promo code. If you tube sale 10, it'll give you a 10% discount. Yeah, can you use those tubes in the winter? Or you yes, you can. What you want to do is uh, deflate it about uh, 25%. And then fill it back up in the, in the, uh, when the free freeze is done. AIRE Industries. But there's all kinds of companies out there. What was the code? Uh, oh, tube sale, T-U-B-E, sale 10. And uh, one other public service announcement, because um, I have personal information on it. If uh, you're swimming where there's a lot of electricity, be very mindful of electric drowning. Um, I, don't know, I saw, Craig, are you here? From Chester. Do you guys have have the meter or t uh, the ability to test water if there's current? Okay, I th I'm not sure if New Baltimore does. I know we do. Call your fire department. They'll have a, a thing they can put in the water to see if there's current in there. But if there's boats, uh, electrical hoists, chances are there's uh, wires in the water. So I think that's it. Thanks, Ari. All right. Thank you, Mr. Yeah. Bryson, for your uh, no <laughs> for your comments on uh, your experience last year. So with that, uh, we will open the floor up to questions. Um, as you can see, we have a wired mic, so we can't bring it out into the audience. So what we'll try is go ahead and ask ask your questions, and if we can't hear you, we'll probably have to ask we'll probably have to ask you all to come up front to uh, speak into the mic. Uh, yes, ma'am, we'll start right here. I have a question regarding um, emergency management. In the event that we do have a disastrous flood, at what point in time will the public utilities, if at all, be shut off? Gas, electric, for all of those safety reasons. You know what, to, to be honest with you, I'd like to follow up with our partners at DTE and consumers before I give you a specific answer to that. Um, it's well beyond anything that we've experienced at this point. I'm sorry. The question was, at what point would um, there be consideration from our public utility partners in um, turning off utilities such as gas, electrical, and water in the event of flooding? Um, if any of the other panelists has any input on that, uh, you can go ahead and step in. But um, it's beyond it's beyond anything we've seen so far. I don't anticipate that that would be the case. But that is something that we will follow up on and add to our FAQs and put on the website. Back to those panels, those two panels were sandbagging. Uh, he asked the Army Corps of Engineers to go back a couple of slides to. Look, that's the second. Are these are these for canals? So the question posed was uh, the sandbagging technique right here, does it apply for canals? Yes. So um, it's kind of standard. Um, so it works really well in wave environments as well. But in canals, it, you have a quieter um, water environment. So some of them are less important, but these are always kind of your best practices. So what do we do for the lake? I know right now the six foot wave will just tear the crap out of both of these things. So the question was, what do we do on the lakefront if you're experiencing six-foot waves? Is that really going to stand up to it? Um, to be honest, sandbagging is not the right option for six-foot waves. Let me, back in seven, back in 1972, I came on the scene in Chesterfield Township. What I was doing immediately was sandbagging. Well, didn't work on the lake. I don't think the water was high as it was today. 
the Corps of Engineers, which some of you guys are too young to remember, they put, they put cribbing along the lake. Maybe about, uh, I don't know, four or five foot wide, maybe about four foot high, and filled them with sand. It worked beautifully. And I know it didn't, it didn't, uh, it wasn't four months for them to get going on it. As soon as we had high water, they started working on it, and it was done. That's all. So I can, I can address that. Um, so the program that did that back in the 80s is known as Advanced Measures. It is our third uh, capability. So we have technical assistance, direct assistance, and advanced measures. We still have that as an authority. We still have it as a capability. Um, the reason that we don't often talk about it is because if you want to talk about government hoops, this is a hoopy program. So um, we are actively talking with the state and with the county about if that would be something we could put into communities. It is 100% federally funded, but it does require a request directly from the governor herself. So we are actively talking about it. Um, advanced measures has been on, on the table essentially from summer of last year. So we're tracking the need for sure, and it is a conversation. Well, everybody should be writing her, though. Well, I think our local politician should be. Well, yeah, we're going to I have a question for Lauren. Um, is the outflow of Lake Ontario controlled? And if it is, why not just open up the valve? <laughs> okay, so. I guess I don't need to repeat the question because you all heard it. Um, so, so Lake Ontario is the outflow is controlled at the Moses Saunders, <coughs> Moses Saunders Dam, which is between New York and Cornwall, Ontario. The outflow of Lake Ontario is controlled, but remember what's between Lake Ontario and us. Whatever you do on Lake Ontario is going to have no impact on us because. Water's not gonna go, <laughs> we, have the, we have the Niagara Falls in between us and Lake Ontario, so we have oh. between Lake Erie and Lake Ontario. So the Lake Ontario outflow isn't, you know, isn't gonna impact that. They're managing that more for uh, looking at impacts between Lake Ontario and, and downstream on the St. Lawrence River. But it, it is the lowest Great Lakes, right? It is the lowest Great Lake. It's just so much lower than us that whatever we do there is gonna have no impact. Over Niagara Falls at the same rate. Right, Niagara Falls is just going to be uh, at the same rate as it would have been. So. What's the plan for neighbors who don't take care of their water? The question is, what is the plan for neighbors who don't take care of their water? And I assume that to mean neighbor, if you barricade your property and your neighbors do not. Uh, the, our city council just recently passed an ordinance that requires people to uh, uh, provide uh, protection from flooding, and especially if it, it affects their neighbors. So uh, everyone in the city of New Baltimore, by ordinance, by law, is required to uh, prevent flooding from going into their neighbor's property. So if they don't? If they don't, uh, uh, they'll be hearing from us and if, if, if one thing leads to another, the city eventually would make those uh, repairs and charge them. Do you know if Chesterfield's doing that? Uh, Chesterfield uh, so far has decided not to do that. Um, uh, for you have to ask uh, other, other communities throughout the state, including a number of them in Macomb County have a very similar order. I can, I can address that. Including St. Clair Shores. Um, within the county, as the mayor just said, the city of New Baltimore just recently adopted. Whoa. My apologies. I'm not going to be able to hear for the rest of the night, so you're going to have to speak extra loud with your questions. Yeah. Um, I normally don't use a mic, but I've been under the weather, so I have to. I have a stadium voice, but not tonight. 
Um, so the question was about the ordinance, and the city of New Baltimore just recently adopted one, and they can, the city can take measures in extraordinary times to to enact improvements on residents' properties, and then to and then to build those residents for them. Um, St. Clair Shores has the same ordinance and has for years, and they they notified all of their residents early last year that that resident. Yeah. So they and and they just the city just said they're preparing a letter also to notify residents that that exists and what the procedures would be. They did not they did not use the ordinance at all last year. Uh, same thing with Harrison Township. They have they have that ordinance on the books as well, and they were not forced to use the ordinance last year at all. Chesterfield does not have that ordinance. What about Clay Township? As Clay Township is not in Macomb County, they're outside of by perfume. He, I think he's, he stepped out. Yes, sir. So, what's the town doing right now to prepare for this summer? And how, what is the priority to get access to the sandbag machines? The question was, what is the town doing to prepare for this summer? And specifically, what is the priority to get access to the sandbagging machine that the city recently purchased? One thing we're doing right now is to have this meeting uh, to make myself, uh, the city government, and all of you uh, aware of what's going to go on. But it's in in day to day business, uh, we have uh, ten thousand sandbags, and I don't know how many tons of 15, sand. Uh, fifteen thousand. Fifteen thousand sandbags. We got a lot of sand, a great big pile. Uh, we city council recently agreed to purchase a sandbag machine, which I referred to it requires volunteers uh, but uh, we have volunteers from the city the wrestling team the swim team the football team those kind of young people and uh, uh, they, we look forward to uh, working with them to prepare sandbags uh, we can bring uh, and what we've done in the past is bring sandbags to the residents uh, uh, and the sand so that they could do it almost near their house certain areas are affected more than others um, we've done that in several at the end of several streets if your street required that we do that for you. Uh, it's just that we can't because of the um, the danger of operating this machine the liability would be too great for us to just bring it to your house and say okay use it over the weekend but um, uh, we could bring it to a, a certain place in near a, a, a an area where there is a lot of residents that could use it, or, because it is portable, it's not very, but it is, we could put it on a truck. Uh, more than likely, we would uh, make uh, uh, lots and lots of sandbags at one time and put them available to city to pick up. So at, so at, what, point, what, at what point will the machine be available? Because a lot of people might want it all at once. I would say if you have a group of volunteers that would like to use it, contact the mayor's office and we can coordinate with the Department of Public Works to get your group availability to be able to utilize it. So if you're a property that's dealing with a lot of waves of not lay farm, can we start doing cribbing? Because some of that could be a site that depending on the structure you use. That's not really one of my questions. Cribbing, whether or not they can do that on the shoreline? Uh, the other guy was talking over here about the lake front and what worked back in the 80s. Right. That's... I didn't, I didn't hear the complete question. There, there are, sir, there are other ways uh, to prevent, especially f uh, uh, waves coming in. There are other ways to do that. Uh, s some people in New Baltimore are getting ready to do that now. They've done that at Saint, uh, in Gross Point Farms, Gross Point Shores, uh, St. Clair Shores. Uh, they build like a berm. It looks kind of like a, um, a, uh, a, a planter where people put uh, wood on both sides, fill it up with dirt, and prevent and with, with uh, sure, go ahead. Oh, well, that's out of my jurisdiction. I'll, I'll take that. <laughs> okay. um, they are selling plant on seawalls that you can back that up. This the is the lady. This is a lady from the. The state of Michigan EGLE that you get your permits, formerly known as DQ. We do not require permits to extend your seawall vertically. What? Sir. 
not too long ago, there was sewage that came out at Lake St. Clair by uh, St. Clair Shores. And I, I think that we don't have or will not have that kind of a problem in this area. Is that true? Did you hear the question, Ken? The question had to do with um, the recent sewage release near St. Clair Shores and whether or not uh, there was a risk of that happening in the New Baltimore area. Uh, New, New Baltimore has its own water and wastewater treatment plant. Um, uh, we are under, uh, we have a permit from the state which it regulates us and part of that permit is testing every day. Uh, so far, we are not in danger of having the water come up so high that we can't discharge into the lake. Um, do, you, do you want to come in? I did speak with our wastewater treatment plant uh, director today, and he did confirm for me that at least in the last 15 years, we have never had to release into Lake St. Clair, and he does not anticipate that we would have to do it any time in the future. Second part of that question is, what else is being done to prevent what happened in St. Clair Shores from happening in the future. I understand it's going to be millions and millions of dollars that the state does not have. Do you want to answer that? Public works. <laughs> 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 All right. It's a, you know, it's a kind of a compounded question that's got a lot of, a lot of avenues to it. Um, if everybody understands that you have combined sewers and, you know, separated sewers. Combined sewers are when you have the storm water and the sanitary sewer all in one. And the older communities, that's what they have, is a combined sewer. You have uh, sewer separation up here, so the only time that you would have problems in this area is if people would start pumping water into your sanitary sewer, like the mayor was talking earlier. Do not do that, because that would upset your, your sewer treatment plant in these type of places. But our department is working right now uh, vigorously trying to stop you know any of those uh, discharges because of what happens when you get the high water events with a lot of rain that you know filling the pipes all up holding more than what we can release to the city of detroit you know to you know that sewer treatment plant and we have storage capabilities and we're trying to increase them storage capabilities and some of the communities are trying to get uh, uh, sewer separation programs going so in a nutshell, Oakland County is still discharging into the Red Run drain. Macomb County still has Chapton and uh, Martin drains, and we're working on it. And we're actually working on another project right now with uh, Egel on trying to increase our volume that we can hold before we have to do uh, the discharge, which is partially clean and it, and it meets the requirements for that, but it's still, you know, we still don't want to dump it in there. So just to, you know, kind of collect some of the, the larger stuff off of the screens and then it's chlorinated but it's still we still want to make it better so we don't have to do any more discharging and that's what our department is working on as we speak no estimate about when that will be there's a lot of moving parts we're waiting we're trying to get a permit we have engineering going on um it'd be ideal if those communities could uh, come up with uh, lots of money so that they can do sewer you know sewer separations which would be the ultimate goal but uh, right now, the quick fix is we could probably have a lot less discharges within the next two years if we can go ahead with, uh, with the program that we already have going, ongoing. Yes, sir. I'd like to follow up on that question. Uh, we in this community, or on the Lake community, are paying for Oakland County and McClellan County. We're penalizing us, it's taxing us, we're costing us money because they're dumping more water into an already exacerbated problem. Like when we had the three inches two weeks ago, our water went up seven inches. That's because they don't. How can we stop that? Well, that, that the city of New Baltimore is not connected to the Detroit system. I know New Baltimore isn't there, okay. but that water is still coming from a cold oh. and open county. Yeah, it's coming into our lake. Yeah. Right. In our lake, and we're paying for it living on the lake because now it's rising. Yeah. Sir? Uh, we're being terribly taxed for this problem. Even if it was a completed with the sewer plant operation, it's still discharged out into the lake. Right. All of everybody's water discharges, it's the natural flow of the water of what it goes out into there. Our biggest the water's gonna go there no matter what. It's just our concern is trying to get a treated 
of treated water to go out into it. So why don't they build their own basins and put dump of their crap in our backyard? Talk to Oakland County and we're working on it in Macomb. That's a valid question. I don't disagree. And that's what either you know the boss doesn't either, and that's why she's yeah, vigorous. from here. She gotta do something about it. She's vigorously working on it. She's open all the time. So that's why I said we got projects going and we're waiting on permits to see if we can go forward with that. But no matter what, the water is going to end up out there, whether it's treated or not. We want it treated, and that's that's our goal. At the very least, but why have to have it? It still have to go there, sir. No matter what, the water's all got to dump in there, Don't even if it's there. treated. The discharge for Detroit sewer plant, which most of the stuff goes to, still dumps out into the water. <laughs> all treated water, even your treated water from your sewer plant, goes out there. All the storm water goes out there. All the all the water from the, the Clinton River watershed, and then you know those all the watersheds. This question is actually for the ladies of uh, the from the Corps of Engineers and the Eagle. Being that we have uh, an immediate and imminent danger of, of of losing our properties and our shorelines, are you expediting your permit process? I recently had a permit. It took me nine months to get it. Now, we don't have nine months to wait. The question is whether um, Eagle and the Army Corps of Engineers are expediting um, permit processes. I'm going to go to Eagle first, and then we'll come back to Army Corps of Engineers. In uh, October, we started an internal response um, group, and we have expedited permits now for emergencies. You need to let us know. Um, what we want to get the message out is you need to apply before it's an emergency. You need to start protecting your properties now, okay? If there's an emergency, if you're losing um, your property or something like that, fill out the application, let us know, and we'll push it through. And there's a whole process in place for that. How long are they good for? Uh, permits are good for five years. Um, they don't, we don't close them out, they expire after five years and then you have to reapply. I'm telling people to put flood mitigation right on the permit, right on top. Well, we don't take paper permits. It's all electronic. There were flyers on the back. Um, I don't, if you don't have that, give your name and we'll send out that information. I'm going to have Army Corps comment on that briefly as well. So I'm not regulatory, so I'm speaking outside my office. Um, they are expediting. There is not a solid rule, though. So it's not, you know, we guarantee 24 hours, whatever. It is not that process. Well, I have so to be honest. You guys were the offenders. Eagle was right on it. They had our permit within three weeks. We waited almost nine months for the Army Corps to respond. I can't advise on your particular case. I'm sorry. Um, I would I would highly recommend just making sure that you're talking with your permit caseworker, essentially, and just making them aware of the circumstances of your permit. And you have adequate people to, to capacitate that during this time of need. I cannot speak for that office. Okay. I, I apologize. Yes, ma'am. Are there any uh, some of the some of us have spent like tens of thousands of dollars already in, in flood mitigation. Are there any tax breaks or any any programs for assistance? Um, not too bad again. <laughs> um, if I'll comment from the county level, there uh, there are no tax there are no tax breaks that I'm aware of from the county level that would cover that. Um, from the local level, no, the, no as well, and I don't. I don't think from the state. No. I don't think from the state level. Tax, any tax incentives I know for. Nothing about okay. <laughs> we can follow up on that okay. and make sure we get an answer in the follow ups. Okay. How about uh, technical assistance beyond uh, San Diego? We are beyond San Diego. We, we live on a peninsula with a lot of wave action, and the Army Corps of Engineers has been to our location about five times. They recommended sandbags. They all, thousands of them went back into the lake. We need better technical assistance. Can we get that from you? Crystal? By better, I mean we want to build a berm. 
and we would like to have better technical assistance to do something like that. We're to, beyond sandbag. To summarize the question, um, what are the limits of technical assistance okay. beyond sandbagging? Does that summarize it adequately? Yeah. So technical assist assistance, the base goal of it is to provide assistance in terms of recommending temporary flood protection measures. If you're willing and have the funding to put in permanent measures like berms or something like that, we're on board. So oftentimes when we're in your community, we're advising on what is going to help this problem right now. What can you do today? So that's often why it goes to sandbags. When it goes to something beyond sandbags to berms, again, we're, we're in. Oftentimes that's the, uh, the, the best next step. But what we cannot do is as an agency act as a private engineering firm. So where we have to stop is we cannot design the berm, we cannot recommend the height of the berm, anything like that. We so can't provide drawings or anything like what, that. What do we do? So you're in my shoes and you need technical expertise and you're telling me the Army Corps of Engineers can't help me. Who can help me without spending a shitload of money? We are going to be very honest, and I'm speaking collectively, so don't leave me out hanging, guys. Um, there, are, there are limited resources for private homeowners. That's kind of the crux of the issue. So when we're providing technical assistance, we're doing it at the support of the city, the county, the state. So we're there kind of hitting their goals and their priorities. So if, if we're talking about a community berm or That's there's what water. This is. Yeah. That's what she's talking about. Yeah, it's, a, it's, for, it's, it's for a group of 15, 20 mm -hmm. homes. Is so, the water in the streets? Yes. Yeah. Is it impacting the sewers? They're welded shut, I think. Yeah, the sewer system welded shut. They're, then, then this we is flooded over 45 times in the last year. They're basically year. at or below lake level. Where are you? <coughs> they're right there. Bay Street. Bay Street. Okay, gotcha. You can see it from here. Uh, yeah, gotcha. So this is a perfect example. So again, I'm here in support of the city, the county, the state. So I cannot come out and advise you individually. This is a case where I'm sure they're, they're aware as they know exactly where you live, but this is a case where it would have to come through that line of communication to us as this is a challenge that we really need assistance with and it would most likely go beyond technical assistance. Technical assistance is for immediate flood protection strategies. We already sent you a letter in writing in July with that very question and we never responded to it. So what do we do next? Please stop by afterwards. I will give you a card. Um, I did not see the letter, so I can't advise on that, but yeah. yes. Okay. Sir? Yes. Uh, this is kind of addressed to the mayor and the members of the city council. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I've yeah. spoken over the last couple of years about the seawall at the end of Lopes. It's falling down. I've asked the mayor a couple of times. I've asked the city council member here. My wife says email flow payment. We've got no response. If that seawall goes down, it's going to tear my seawall down. It's going to flood my house. And so far, all the talk and all the jumble that everybody's been saying here, I'm looking at one house that I'm concerned about. That's mine. If that seawall goes down and my seawall goes down, I'm that problem. Who's going to be taking care of that? All the dirt erosion. The erosion has come up. You, that seawall is this high, and the erosion from the waves is taking two foot of soil out of there. Rocks, bricks, all that stuff is coming up into my yard. And I've got a seawall that was designed to flow, every, all the water flow away from my house. Now all that stuff is blocked, that flow is opportunity. So the city's not going to do nothing. If they're talking about all this stuff of cribbing and the, the uh, Corps of Engineers and everybody involved, the city needs to take care of their own problems. Yes, I, I agree with you. The city has to take care of their own problems. And uh, at, 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 at every one of those dead-end streets, including Wilton, the city owns some property. And uh, it is our job to make sure that that, that property, the, the seawalls do not fail. Well, the city needs to go out and inspect that. Okay. 
It's terrible. It's okay, terrible. because there there are other city assets down there that we need to protect besides the seawall, and to make sure that it does. Our, just that we were talking about um, having people make sure that their uh, property, their, the flooding on their property doesn't affect anybody else. Well, it's our job to make sure that the flooding on, on the city property doesn't affect you. Okay, so um, I, I. Okay, I, I, I hear you. Uh, I hear you. Okay. Thank you. I, I appreciate you standing up and saying something. Another neighbor right here. Sir? I have a question for the uh, Army Corps. Um, my situation is the neighbor is ignoring his seawall. It's kicking out from the bottom. It's already blowing out four feet per permit. So I have to be tied to him. He's pulling my seawall. What can I do? Do I have to wait till it collapses? I think that's a city question. So the question was... I, I apologize for taking the time, but I'm actually in Chesterfield, so I'm very interested. He's in okay. So it's not yeah, he's, in, he's in Chesterfield Township. Okay, just grab the, the fellow with the cap at the, at the door. Wait. Hold on just a second. Um, just a second. In, in past discussions, I was just looking through our phone. In past discussions, I, I do know the, it, what, what, you, what you need is that seawall is caving in. So what it needs is straightening and backfilling. It's caving out. Really yes. Tiebacks. It, 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 right, the tiebacks are right. We're, we're, it's already been done once, probably about 30 years ago. You can see the repairs. Okay. I just want to let you know that the, the city, the, the, the DPS is well aware of that. And it's on the radar. And I don't know what the date is for the plan, but we know that we have to fix it. Thank you. You're welcome. So, two-part answer to your question: one that's going to be specific to your situation in Chesterfield Township, and then one that's generally applicable to everyone else here. And the gentleman's question, if you didn't hear it, had to do with um, if if a neighbor's seawall is collapsing and they are not doing anything with it. Um, what can they do? Uh, two things that I would say is, number one, and Crystal, you can back me up on this, it might be appropriate for you to schedule technical assistance, not to, not to fix the seawall, not to fix the, their neighbor's seawall necessarily, but to see if there's anything they can do on their property to, if there's anything sandbagging-wise you can do on your property in order to protect it. I, no, I, I understand, but the other, the other issue is we don't have anybody here because that's a city enforcement issue, or that's a township enforcement issue. Township says they won't do anything. Got to go to the army corps. Okay. So yes, there is an engineering solution that needs to be applied for you to deal with that issue that's going on. We as a federal government agency cannot get involved in engineering decisions on private property. So, but yet you make me tie to his by my permit. So there's got to be some responsibility. So I would also def I would also go back to Brandon's decision or Brandon's statement that it is it's an enforcement issue. So that's something that we couldn't get involved with that. He is not us. That, that's what I can say definitively. Whose issue is it except mine? The township already said no. You're saying no. I'm stuck until his seawall collapses and cost me $100,000 to rebuild. Bullshit. Okay. Hi, Robert Primo from Eagle. Um, just really brief. It sounds like it might be a civil issue that it might be best addressed through a private lawsuit, I think, right? If it's a neighbor-neighbor dispute. I mean, I'm not really necessarily in a position to give legal advice. I'm just working out my head. It sounds like it might be. Wow. Yeah, because the only thing I can say from the from the county's perspective on that is the, the county has no enforcement power over seawalls. So there's there's nothing that, there's no answer that I can give you to, 
to your question from the uh, from the county's perspective. I'm unsure of why the township's answer was what it was. I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but Chesterfield Township is doing a similar forum to this one next week on, on the 4th, and we'll be there, and Chesterfield Township officials. Maybe you could prepare, because I'll answer if it the same question. The answer will still be the same, that we are not the enforcement agency. Yes, ma'am. The, the question was whether or not uh, cribbing is being done anywhere in New Baltimore, and that was not the impression that I, no, no, that no, I got. No cribbing is being done. It was done in the. It was done prior to the high water. Uh, it, it was done in the in the 1970s when the water came up. Uh, in fact, it was done right at the property next to mine. So I, I'm well aware of what the cribbing was, but there is nothing being done now. It, what, what it was was the, the Corps of Engineers came through to protect assets like sewer lines that was running along the lake. And if there was somebody there with no break wall, they would come in with uh, a stone and fill up cages, fill up cages with stone and uh, uh, to protect the waves from eroding the, the assets, the sewer and water and wastewater assets of uh, the city. Uh, so it's a health issue and this. The Corps of Engineers did that and that was in the 1970s. All the way to that, ma'am. So the question was about um, yeah the question was about splash guards for when the for the wind is high blowing out of the blowing out of the south here on Anchor Bay and whether whether they're effective or not I personally have no experience with them and it sounds like a couple of your neighbors do and might have some feedback for you and did you have any any comments on that. So that's exactly the question that we would address under technical assistance, is we would come at, at on, under an appointment with the city, we would come onto your property and actually look at the height of your seawall, look at your wave environment, look at the actual topography of your yard, and make a more tailored recommendation for what you can do for temporary flood protection right now. Um, okay. You think you do that, but that's not what you do. Because when they come out, all they talk about are sandbags. And when you try and ask for additional information, they say no. The only thing we can tell you to do and show you how to do is make sandbags. So that's the problem. Because many of us are beyond sandbags and need better technical resources. So I'm just telling you because they came out and we asked that very question and they said no, we can only talk sandbags. And I definitely appreciate that feedback. I want to learn more about this particular property. I am tracking, I've been reminded what the area is. But they came out um, five times and five times they said the same thing. Okay, so. If the conversation starts going into longer term solutions, that's where our technical assistance ends. So I, I think that would be my, my only clarifying Well, point. I think everybody here realizes that we're looking at long-term solutions now. Mm -hmm. I mean, with climate change, with the trajectory of the lakes going up and the volatility, we're looking for long-term. Everybody here needs a long-term solution if we're going to stay on the lake. So I think the time is now for all of you to realize if I mean, we need long-term solutions. It can't just be about sandbags. 
we need we really need your help and we've been asking for it i mean the mayor's done a great job they've done a fantastic job but that's not their area of expertise and we've been begging you guys for more expertise and that's what we all need here we need to know about better wave deflection systems we need to know about the best solution, burns, whatever. Our property has flooded over 40 times in the last year. So it's time, I mean, we're past, you know, hey, uh, you know, uh, call FEMA. FEMA's been out. They've already paid whatever they can pay. We need more help than you're giving us. I would highly recommend in that case for talking about systems with permanent construction that would fall under our other authorities the two to ten year type programs so where we are right now it sounds like it's we're in between sandbags are not cutting it but we're two to ten years out from a construction project so that is where we're working with your with our partners but we cannot go beyond temporary flood protection under technical assistance maybe we Maybe we could have uh, one more question. One final question, sir. Did I hear correctly that the first step would be to contact the uh, city hall in order to have somebody come out to uh, review our property? Yes. Yes, that is correct. Yeah, give me a call. Give Bonnie a call. So with that, um, thank you all for thank you all for coming tonight. Um, we'll be around for a few more minutes if you have any additional questions or comments and we really appreciate your time thank you